Good morning. How is everybody? Do you like this cooler weather? Isn't this nice? We're heading for fall. Today's message is going to be the last of the series on God. Next week I'll talk about God's Word, and then we'll talk about humanity, human beings, what you might call spiritual anthropology, how God sees us, how we really are, maybe answer some questions about why people do the things they do. And then finally we'll end up with God's plan for our eternal salvation. I've talked about God the Father. I've shown from Scripture how God has revealed himself to every human in nature, whether you look up in the stars at night or you peer into a a microscope and look at our DNA, that God has left evidence that he exists. All we can determine from nature, though, is there is a God. We have to go to God's Word, which I'll talk about next week, to find out what this supreme creator is like. I've talked about God the Son and pointed out that there are actually three persons in the Godhead. Even though God is one, God exists as a unity, and there's only one God. There are not multiplicities of gods. There's not a hierarchy of gods and angels and demons and all this stuff. There's one God who's eternal. Everything else, including angels and demons and whatever, has been created. There's only one creator who existed before anything else, and that was God. But he exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons with their own personality, with their own emotions. They all three feel God can be happy, God can be sad, God can be angry, God can be uh, sorrowful or thoughtful. Or, you know, read your, read your word and you'll see that God expresses himself in various emotions. But there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I spoke last week about the Holy Spirit. So now I want to tie the three together in their working out this great plan of salvation that is going to save the human race from itself. The greatest blessings in life flow out of God's order. There is an order that God has established. There's order in the universe. He ordained order in the world. He ordained order in business and family structure and the church and everything else. And so when we follow God's order, we're blessed. And when we rebel against God's order, we suffer the consequences of it. So if you want blessings in life, you need to... Find out what God's order is all about, and then follow that. <clears throat> and this all starts with order in the family, which, by the way, is one of the reasons there is such a, a major attack by many, many, many forces here in the world today against the family. If you break down the nuclear family that God ordained from the beginning then you are breaking down God's, you're rebelling against God's order, his authority, and you're going to want to replace it with something else. Is that not what we see today going on in the world? You see today in America, for example, where parents of children who go to school are told to shut up and allow the professionals to teach their children whatever the professionals want to teach their children, and that they have no say in the matter. See, that's a rebellion to the family structure that God has ordained. 
And I'd be the first one to stand up and tell those people, take a hike. Because the first and primary people that have, what's the word I'm looking for? Influence, thank you, Chris. That have influence over their children is the mother and the father. That's what God has ordained. And if the world doesn't like it, or this group or that group doesn't like it, well, too bad, so sad. They're in rebellion to God's order, but they don't need to, to draw the rest of us in. So it starts with the family structure. God has ordained authority in every sphere of life, whether that's the civil arena, government, business or economics, the church, and the family. So in order to understand this, we need to go back to the Trinity. This circle represents God in his oneness. Now you'll notice that within the circle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you all see that? Can you all see the equal signs between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If you remember your grade school mathematics, equal means equal. The Father is equal to the Son. The Son is equal to the Father. The Father is equal with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is equal with the Father. The Son is equal with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is equal with the Son. All three are equal in their being. They are all eternal. They are all omniscient or all-knowing. They are all omnipotent. And they are all united. They're equal in their being, in their essence. Do you all understand that? Yes? No? Okay. In their eternal existence, you can think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me give you a physical analogy. Picture the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit sitting uh, uh, on stools around a campfire up in the mountains during a picnic. And they're sitting around this campfire as equals, talking and discussing back and forth. That communion has been going on forever. Can you all picture that? Yes. They are equals. And that's the first point. They are equals. The theologians have a term for this. It's called ontological equality. Now, the word ontological simply means in their being. You don't need to remember that. Just know that it exists. That theologians for a thousand, two thousand years have been studying, Christian theologians have been studying the scriptures and studying the characteristic of the one God. And they came up with this phrase, the ontological equality. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are equal in their being. There's that famous verse. Can you all see the verse? Deuteronomy 6 4? Yes. That's the Hebrew Shema. It's called the Shema because the Hebrew word Shema means here. And to the Hebrews, the first word is usually significant. So that's how you can remember the Shema because it starts out and says, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel. Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. And as I've told you many times before, I'll re repeat it again. When the teachers of the law and the Pharisees came to the Lord Jesus, they said, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? They were testing him. Maybe they wanted to know what his opinion is. Maybe they, they were firm in their opinion of what the greatest commandment was. But he, like a laser beam, cut right to the point. What's the greatest commandment? And he said, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. And then he added, And you shall love. 
the Lord your God. This is verse 5, the next verse. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. You remember that? This is the first and greatest commandment, the Lord Jesus said. And the second is like it. What was the second commandment? The second greatest commandment. Say it louder. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and all of the commandments hang on those two laws. But the part we're concerned on is the Lord our God, the Lord is what? One. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, or equal. This equality of being is why Jesus could say, we went over this last week, I and the Father are one. Now remember when he said that, the Jewish people picked up stones to stone him to death because as far as they were concerned, that was blasphemy. This man standing before them just declared that he and God were one. He made himself equal to God, to the eternal one. And for them, that was the worst form of blasphemy. And on more than one occasion, they would pick up stones to stone him for blasphemy. Jesus further could add, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. We're one. I mean, that's a concept that, that is kind of hard for us to grasp, but it's true, nevertheless. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. They are all three eternal. They are all three omnipotent, all-powerful. The galaxies that spin in the night sky, every star, the very atoms of the universe, the very subatomic particles are all controlled by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they, all the things that make up this physical universe, are controlled by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and He or they can do whatever they want with everything. That's power. That's omnipotence, all power, total power. All three of them are omniscient. They know everything. They knew what just flew through Brad's mind right now. Father and son probably looked at each other and went, naive, hey. They are truly omniscient. They know everything. As David says in the Psalms, Lord, you know my thoughts. Now, personally speaking, isn't that a little spooky to you? Isn't that a little scary to you? The thoughts that go through your brain, the electrochemical transactions that happen in your brain that cause you to think thoughts, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit sees and hears and understands and knows. Good and bad. That's omniscience. Everything that has ever happened in time, everything that is happening right now in the entire universe, and everything that may happen way down the future that we cannot even imagine is open and laid bare before the Lord, as the scripture says. It's all laid out before him. God sees it all. That's omniscience. He knows everything that's going to happen in your life. He knows every breath you're going to take. He knows every decision you're going to make, right or wrong. He knows every interaction of every person that you're going to cross paths with. He knows everywhere you're going to go. He knows every dream that you're going to dream at night when you're asleep. God knows everything. That is omniscience. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all three omniscient. They know it all. And yet the three are one God. 
But in the administration of man's salvation, this great, what we call the great plan of salvation, the Trinity each played a different part. And there's a word I introduce you to, subordination. Now you'll notice I have the word administration underlined. In the Greek, it's found in the, the New Testament as administering. Uh, oikonomia is the actual Greek word. It means oikos is house, nomos is rule. So oikonomia is the rule of the house. How do you rule a house? Or how do you administer a house? Or a business? Or the church? Or society? That's what administration means. To, to follow a set of principles or guidelines for the orderly rule of something. Do you all understand that? Yes? yes? And in the administration of their plan of salvation for you and I and for the human race, they introduce us to something called subordination. Now the root there is the word order. If, if somebody is ordained, they are appointed to go and do something. We all are under order. The word sub in front of it means below, like submarine means below the sea. So subordination simply means to be in order underneath somebody else. You all understand that? Now, in the military, if a junior person speaks out or disobeys a superior order, he can be charged with insubordination. And I wish my friend from uh, Fowler were here, the Air Force General who retired, I would have him get up and tell you that insubordination is not a light thing in the US military. You can end up in prison for being insubordinate to one of your superior officers. Do you all understand that? They take it very seriously. Not as seriously as God, but they do take it more seriously than the general public. Here, Brianna can take a job. And she can like the job or not like the job. But if Brianna has a bad day and her boss comes to her and says, Brianna, would you do this or that? Brianna can say, I don't want to. Right? I quit. Say, she could just, can she not? Yeah. And we don't think anything about it. Okay, well, she was insubordinate to her boss, her manager or whatever. But to God, it is a divine principle and it is very serious. Do you all understand what I'm getting at? And all this has to do with your my salvation. Now, there's that circle of God again, but you notice they're in different positions. God the Father is at the top. God the Son is blowing a little to his right. And God the Holy Spirit is below both of them. And then again, I have arrows pointing. So for example, if you look at Jesus the Son, you have an arrow pointing from Jesus to the Father. You all see that arrow? That means that Jesus agreed to voluntarily subordinate himself or to submit himself to God the Father. They're equal, but he agreed that he would be, that the Father would be above him, that the Father would be greater than him in this plan of salvation. And the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, you'll see two arrows going from him, one to the Father and one to the Son. You all see that? And that means that the Holy Spirit agreed that he, the Holy Spirit, would be subordinate or submit himself to both the Father and the Son in this plan of salvation. So there's an order that they established in this plan. Even though they're equal, remember the circle with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit equal? Even though they are equal in their being, in their essence, they agreed to this structure for our salvation. 
Now the question becomes, why would they do that? What were they trying to show us? What, what is the purpose of this? When Jesus took on human flesh, when he became a human, when he left the Godhead, as it were, came down to earth and took on baby Jesus, when he inhabited the, the egg in, in Mary's womb, when he took on human flesh, he subordinated himself or he submitted himself to the Father. That's why he could say, the Father is greater than I. But I thought the Father is equal to the Son, the Son is equal to the Father. They are in their essence. Do you all understand that? But Jesus agreed that he would submit himself to the Father. Why? As an example to you and me. For our benefit. Note, I asked this question last week. Jesus told the disciples on the last night he was here on earth before he was crucified, I tell you, I need to go away. And the disciples got very sad about that. And he said, no, no. It's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the advocate, the counselor, the comforter, he cannot come. But if I go away, now, the question is, who's going to send the Holy Spirit to the disciples? Who said that? She got it right. Jody, you got a quarter? <gasps> Guess what? I have a quarter. <laughs> you all who were here last week should have answered that just that fast. The scripture tells us, Jesus says in the 14th chapter of John that the Holy Spirit will be sent by God the Father. And yet two chapters later in this long dialogue he has with his disciples, he says, I am going to send the Holy Spirit. It is not a contradiction. It's that the Father and Son are equal in their being, but that in the order of salvation, in the plan that God has, both the Father and the Son are going to send the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus was on earth, the Holy Spirit couldn't come and dwell within each of us. That's why he told him, it is to your advantage that I go away. I have to go back. I have to return to the Father. But when I go back, the Father and I are going to send the Holy Spirit. And this is going to be better for you than even me being here. Why? Why would it be better for the Holy Spirit to be here than Jesus to be here? Because the Holy Spirit's going to be with you all the time. And when Jesus was here, he was limited just like you and I to being in one place at one time. I'm limited to being in this spot right now. Do you all understand that? I have a physical body. And there are limitations. And the same with Jesus. If he was in Galilee up north in Capernaum, he couldn't be down south in the Negev. If he were in this city, he couldn't be in that city. He could be healing here, but if he's healing here, he can't be healing there. If he's teaching over here, he can't be teaching over there. Do you all understand? But he says, it's to your advantage that I go away because when I go, the Father will send the comforter, the advocate, the counselor, and he will be with you, and he will be in you. And so it will be like God walking around in all of us. And that is why the disciples on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended and empowered them, they could go out north, south, east, and west and do miracles everywhere. Not just in this city, or that city, or this city. One by one like Jesus did. Because now they're multiplied. Do you understand that? But the Holy Spirit agreed that he would submit his will to the fathers and he would submit his will to the sons. 
so that if either the Father or the Son or both said, go here, do this, breathe on this person, bring life to this person, heal that person or whatever, teach that person, the Holy Spirit would say, yes. Tell this person that or that person that the Holy Spirit agreed to obey and submit to the Father and the Son. We read again, a little further down, a few verses later, Jesus is explaining, he, who's the he, the Holy Spirit, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. In other words, we, the Father and the Son, we will tell the Holy Spirit what to say, and he will explain to you. But whatever words he gives you came from us. Do you all understand? Jesus and the Holy Spirit submitted themselves to the Father's authority. They, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is our model. Jesus said, I do nothing on my own, but I speak just what the Father has taught me. Do you see the order there? Do you all see the order? Jesus said, I speak nothing on my own, but only what the Father taught me. Now, <clears throat> how did the Father teach him? From the little child, Jesus was reading this. From childhood, he was memorizing it. He had to grow in knowledge just like you and me because he agreed that he would be fully human. So he had to be like Tana or Chad. He had to start out and he had to read and memorize and learn. That's how he knew what the Father wanted him to say because the Father taught him. And how did the Father teach him? In his word. That's why he would say over and over again, it is written. It's written where? In the Bible, in the scriptures. John, chapter 14. These words that you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father. The Father what? Who sent me. Do you all see Jesus' submission to the Father here? Do you, all, do you all see that? He submitted himself to his Father's will. He spoke only what the Father taught him. He did not speak his own words, but what the Father gave to him. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. He, well, let's go on. Jesus would say, all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. There's your order. The Father has total authority in this plan of salvation. Everything belongs to God the Father. And Jesus says, because I have been obedient... Everything that the Father has is now whose? Mine. And what does Jesus say about the Spirit? This is why he said the Spirit will take from what is now mine and make it known to you. Father, Son, Spirit. Do you all see that? Do you all see the order? From the Father to the Son, and the Spirit will take from what is mine, which was given to me by the Father, and make it known to you. Paul put it this way when he wrote to the church at Philippi. And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient to whom? To the Father. He became obedient to the point of death. 
Even death on a cross, a humiliating death, a painful death. Why? Because that was the Father's will. Why? Because he wanted a way to pay for our sins so that we wouldn't have to pay for our sins ourselves. So the Father ordained that the Son would come down and live the perfect life, the sinless life, and then willingly lay down his life in your place and in my place. Even the, he knew, Jesus knew he was going to the cross. He knew he was going to die a very horrible, painful death, but he was obedient for your sake, for each one of you individually's sake. You need to put that, you need to put that in, the, in the center of your heart. He did that for you individually. One by one by one by one. He did that for me. Aren't you glad that he was obedient? Seriously, aren't you glad that he was submissive to his father's will? And because Jesus submitted himself to his Father's will, he could say this. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And this leads us to a divine principle, people. There's a lesson here to be learned. Are you ready? You've heard it all before. The light bulb's going to go chick, chick. Jody and I have either lived in houses or been in houses, and I think some of you will be able to relate. When you go into a place like the basement or the attic, there's a light bulb on the ceiling with a little string hanging down. And if you go, what happens? The light bulb comes on, and if you grab that same string and go, it turns off. Well, I hope the light bulb goes on because you've all heard this before, but maybe this time the light bulb will go on and stay on for some of us. If anyone wants to be first, he should be last of all and servant of all. If God the Son and God the Holy Spirit could submit themselves to an authority above them, even though they were equal, then we should do the same. And if they could be obedient to the will of the one above, the Father, then we should do the same. And in your desire in this life to be cool, to be special, to be lifted up, to have other people admire you, or whatever, if you want to be in first place, if you want to be first of all, what do you have to do? You have to be servant of all. Do you all see that? You have to lower yourself to be raised up. And Jesus lowered himself to total obedience to the Father, even to the point of death, even to the point of a horrible death on the cross. And so the Father raises him up to the very top. Or Mark says the same thing. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be what? This is not the teaching of the world. It is exactly 180 degrees opposite from what the world teaches. What the world teaches is, if you want to be first, claw your way to the top. What the world teaches is, you've got to climb on the heads of the others to get to the top of the pyramid. You've got to be vicious or cruel or whatever. You've got to be merciless. Isn't that what the world teaches? Yes. He who is strongest is the leader of the pack. But that's not the kingdom's principle. God says, now, children, which way are you going to act? Are you going to do it the world's way or are you going to do it my way? Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve 
had to give his life a ransom for many. I did not come as a king, Jesus said, so that you all could bow down and wait on me, so that you could bring me my food and, and take care of me. I did not come to be served. I came to serve you. That's why it, the Bible says he poured out his life for us. He was tired a lot because he went, 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 went. Now here, now there, doing something, teaching people, healing people, praying for people. He didn't spend a lot of time in sleep, but, but he was really tired because of it, because he had a body just like you and I, and that body gets tired. You and I, boy, we, we hit the rack, don't we? It says, you know, the end of the night, the disciples would go off to sleep, Jesus would go off to pray. He was a servant to all. Peter tells us that same principle. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may what? You see that same principle? He who would be up must go down. You all understand that principle? Yes? You want to be at the top? You need to submit yourself below. It's everywhere in Scripture. James says the same thing. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will what? So, let's apply this divine principle to one of the first things that God created when he created man on earth, the family. Does that look familiar? That circle is the family. The family is God ordained it. Now, speaking of their being, of their essence, of their standing before God, husband and wife and children are all equal. Do you all understand this? Our founding fathers understood this. That's why it says in what, the Declaration of Independence? We believe that all men are and endowed with certain rights, including the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All men are created what? Equal. Equal. Now the word man, men there means humans. Now how do I know that the husband and the wife and the children are all equal? Because they're all made in whose image? The very first chapters of Genesis. Let us make man humans in our image. So God created humans in his image. Male and female, he created them. So this one has been created in the image of God. And this one has been created in the image of God. And we're not just talking about physical image, we're talking about spiritual as well. There's something about Leland LaRue that reflects the image of God himself. There's something about Mary Jean LaRue that reflects the image of God. God created them in his image. You all understand that? So in the Christian theological world, men and women in their essence, in their being, are equal. Do you all understand that? And the children are also born in the image of God. Are they not? Okay. But look at that. Does that look familiar? But in administering God's plan of salvation, God ordained that principle. Submission to authority or subordination. And in his plan, the father represents like the father himself. The wife 
represents Jesus. But as Jesus submitted himself to the Father, so the wife is to submit herself to the husband. Do you all understand that? I thought the wife and the husband were equal. Say they are. But in the working out of God's plan of salvation, so that we all might understand that there is an order in the universe, the wife agrees to submit herself to the husband, in the Christian tradition at least. Now, I've mentioned this before when going over this. We'll take Kelsey, for example. At the present, Kelsey is not married. Kelsey is free to do whatever Kelsey wants to do. If Kelsey wishes to remain single, can she do that? If Kelsey wishes to get married, can she do that? But in the Christian world, in God's order of things, if Kelsey decides to get married, she has to agree to submit to her husband. And in this 21st century, boy, that just doesn't sit well with Americans, does it? But you see, we're not following American theology. We're following God's theology. And the same thing with the children. They are to submit to who? Look at the arrows. That's right. What is the fourth commandment? No, that was a trick question. That's the fifth commandment. The fourth is the Sabbath. <laughs> Honor your father and mother, kids. The worst form of rebellion to authority starts where? It starts in the family. And you know who propagates it? Mom and dad and the world and to everyone else. We allow it. Today, we allow it. Not so much in the past. We actually do allow it. We allow our kids to talk back to us, don't we? Yep. We allow them to s make snide comments to us, don't we? Yep. Wow. This is in the law. Anyone who curses his mother and father, speaks ill about them, speaks down to them, anyone who curses his father and mother, what do you think the discipline was? What's that say? What? Do you young people understand this? Do you understand that according to God's law, just cursing your mother or father, speaking ill of them, denigrating them before somebody else. God says the penalty is what? Aren't you glad God is patient with you? <laughs> Seriously, aren't you glad that God is long-suffering with you? Because God were simply by, simply about, well, you violated the law, boom! First time you open your mouth against mom or dad in that negative way, you're dead. <sighs> As Peter says, God is long-suffering toward us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So he forbears just striking us down just like that. But it doesn't mean the law has changed. He put that law in there, and it's really strict. Would you agree with me? Okay, let's do another one. And he who strikes his father or mother shall what? You definitely do not ever raise your hand against your mother or father. Ever. That's grounds for instant death. Again, it, is, it happens quite often, but uh, God is long-suffering, but that law hasn't changed. 
Do you all understand what I'm getting at? Aren't you glad now that God is as patient as he is? Hello? Aren't you glad God is as merciful as he is? Because he didn't implement that right like now. He's given you all a chance to repent. And somebody agreed to die for your actions there. When you opened your mouth against your mother or father, and I speak from personal experience as a wild teenager, you incur the penalty of death. And Jesus agreed to pay that penalty for Don. And for you. Aren't you glad he did? Because I can remember somebody... I can remember somebody yelling and screaming at her mama who yelled and screamed back. But she says, did you, did you hear, not only did she do that, but she just lied and said, but I was innocent. <laughs> so I'd have to ask Carol, like I asked the rest of you, aren't you glad Jesus agreed to pay that penalty for you? Now, let me go back. That principle applies to every child. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders of the gate of the town. The elders of the gate of the town. They shall say to the elders, this son of ours is what? Ay, 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 ay. He's stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's profligate and a drunkard. What's profligate mean? He's living a wild life. He's doing his own thing. He's living his life the way he wants, and he's a drunkard. Then all the men of the town, are you ready? Or all the men of his town, shall stone him to death. You must purge the what? The evil from among you, and all Israel will hear of it and be afraid. But you see, we don't do that today, do we? No, what we do is mama turns to somebody who sees this behavior and makes an excuse for him or her. Or papa gives some excuse for why the son or the daughter acts that way and just brushes it off. You are contributing to the rebellion of your own sons and daughters. You are contributing to putting them on the path that if they don't turn away from that path, are going to end up in a lake of fire. Sorry, moms and dads, I'm telling you the way it is. You, you understand that? Because according to the scripture there, that's an evil. It starts in one family, and then that little mouthy rebel goes out and, and hangs out together with his or her mouthy rebels, and they start mouthing together, and they became a little gang of what? Thugs, rebels, and they're, a, they're an evil, they become an evil on society in general. So God says, you cut off the cancer right here. Question, why did God put such laws, strict laws in place? The, to me, they're strict. Are they strict to you? Why did he do that? You think he was trying to tell us something? There's an order in my, in my universe. There's an order in the movement of the stars and galaxy. There's an order in government. There's an order in the church. There's an order in the family. And when you break that order, chaos results. Rebellion results. 
And that leads to death. Ultimately, it leads to death. The death of a family, the death of a, an individual, the death of a society. And I'm telling you, with what I see in the world today, and just in America today, I'm sorry, beloved, we're dying. This country is dying. There's a group, I'm sure most of you have heard about it. <clears throat> there are a bunch of young, mostly young, 20s and 30s, people, they're what we call anarchists, rebels. They call themselves Antifa. Have you heard about Antifa? They, they popped up on the scene a couple of years ago, and they call themselves Antifa, which is short for... They say they're anti-fascist, but what they are is anti-authority in any form. They're just thugs and rebels. They don't want to be in subjection to anybody's authority. I want nobody over me. Therefore, we got to get rid of law enforcement, which leads to what movement? Defund the police. Remember that? I want nobody over me. So we're not going to have any heroes from American history. Tear down their statues. Burn their images. They're thugs. And how do they show that they are Antifa? Especially up in Portland and Seattle and Minneapolis and other cities. Do you remember how they showed their activities? Anybody? Chaos. They went through the cities. You know what? I don't want an employer telling me what to do. But I want a stereo. I want a new iPhone. I want these new Nike shoes. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to no, take it. It doesn't matter if it's a mom and pop shop. I want it. I'm going to take it. So they burned and looted. And what did the government do? Shake your head. He shook his head. Nothing. See, there, that's anarchy, meaning without rule, against rule. It started in the family and grew and grew and grew. And today it's happening in the general society. And the people who are in control, if they're not advocating this garbage, they're at least not doing anything about it. And it's like a cancer that's just spread. It's just spreading. You all see that? Hello? No? Yes? yes? And it's going to get worse. Jesus said, <coughs> Because of the increase of lawlessness, the hearts of many people are going to fail them for what's coming upon the earth. That sounds to me like it's going to get worse and worse and worse. There is an ordained authority that God himself follows for our good. You see, we can't look to the structures that God has ordained, starting with the family, including the civil and church. God has ordained this structure of order, submission to authority, and you can't whine on the day of judgment, but we didn't like it. You applied this to us. Because what will God say? I applied it to myself. We, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we agreed to submission of authority as an example to you. We applied it to ourselves. Do you all see that? Does this make sense? Without authority, there's no order. With no order comes chaos. Chaos brings yeah. 
And God has ordained order. This is his way. Because order brings blessing. Order brings life. Rebellion and chaos bring death. And God is the God of life, not death. Do you all, do you all see where I'm going with this? He wants us to be in submission to authority. Even Jesus submitted himself first to his parents, then to the Roman authorities, and even to the religious leaders, though they hated him. Jesus said, <clears throat> The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They're the leaders. They sit in the seat of authority. That's Moses' seat. So you must what? And do what? Be obedient to your leaders. Well, what if they're hypocrites? Do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. The point being, those who sit in the seat of Moses, so in this analogy, that would be me as the pastor, have to teach you what God has given you. Therefore, you, you have to listen to the words of the teachings that I give you and do them, not for my benefit, for your benefit. Obey your parents. Be honest. Work for a living. Don't steal. Don't speak ill of your neighbor. All the things that I've tried to tell you from God's word. And if I turn out to be a hypocrite, it doesn't matter. You still do what's in here. Does that make sense? Paul said, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. Say, that's civil government. Because God has ordained that there be an authority in charge over cities and nations. Peter puts it this way. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution for such as what? If they say pay taxes, what are you to do? You don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal. You take advantage of every legal means you can to keep as much of your own money as you can, but you pay taxes. You pay revenue. You pay respect to those to whom respect is due. This is what God's word says. Why? Because those who are in the positions of authority deserve our respect. Because it's the way God ordained things. And sometimes those up here are going to be jerks. Doesn't matter. Jesus submitted himself to the jerks. Whether civil or religious. So God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are equal and one in their being, in administering their plan of salvation. They introduced submission or subordination to authority in themselves for what? For our sake. That's why they did it. That's why Jesus submitted himself to the Father. That's why the Holy Spirit submitted himself to both the Father and the Son. To give us the pattern, the model to follow. In the family, in the church, in the government. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> here's a historical fact for you Americans. Are you ready? The founding fathers are trying to hammer out a new form of government. Shall it be a monarchy like they just fought against with the king of America? And there was some talk of making George Washington king, which he promptly refused. So what form of government are we going to have? 
and they studied the great philosophers and they poured over the sacred scriptures and they came up with a three-form type of government with the executive branch as the president, the legislative branch as the Congress, and the judicial branch, which was the Supreme Court. That is what they created. Am I right? Yes? yes. Say yes. yes. Where did they get this idea of this three-form type of government? Yes. They were, no, but that's close. They, they read a French philosopher who said this is the way government should be set up. And he got it from the Bible. Are you ready? Grab your Bibles in front of you and go to Isaiah 33. See, I'm giving you a little secular history thrown in with how our founding fathers came up with the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. You all there? Isaiah 33, go to verse 22. Chris, would you read that? Isaiah 33, 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. Stop right there. Do you see it? The Lord is our, what's the first one? Judge, judge judicial branch, Supreme Court. Second one. The Lord is our lawgiver, the legislative, Congress, they make the laws. Third one, the Lord is our king. He is the executive of everything. That's our executive branch with the president. You see, this Christian French philosopher named de Montesquieu, reading the Bible said this is the way government should be set up with an executive branch, with a judicial branch, and with a legislative branch. And the Americans reading this philosopher said, let's set it up this way. And each one will have checks and balances against the other, usurping power from the other. Isn't that amazing to y'all? Hello? Yeah. That the man who came up with that based it on Isaiah 33, 22. Huh. I just thought I'd throw that out there. One God, three persons. They gave us the model for the family, for the church, for civil government. Again, if Jesus submitted himself to his parents and to the Roman authorities and to his religious leaders, he tells us to what? I hope this has made at least some of you in here feel a little humble this morning. And maybe reflect on our own lives and what we want in this life. I'm not saying that you shouldn't want to whatever it is you want. All I'm saying is God has laid the pattern down for us. And that pattern is, if you want to move up, you have to move down. Does that make sense? No? Yes? Okay. Stand up. And all you young people, do me, all, do me a favor personally. If you decide you want to say something bad about your mom and dad, please don't do it when I'm near. Because I still believe in lightning coming through the ceiling. <laughs> and I don't want to be anywhere around, just in case. Let's pray. Father, we come before your throne. And in spirit... Father, I lift up your sons and daughters before you and ask your forgiveness on all of us for all of our past transgressions. And Father, help us by the Holy Spirit whom you have given us. Help us to be better examples 
and to submit ourselves to one another in love, to family, to workers, to fellow students, to whomever. Help us to be like Jesus was, to be servant to others. And I ask that you do this in your son Jesus' name, Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.